Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Mona Idrisi, author of the Muslim Narcissist book and empowerment coach for Muslims. In today's podcast, I'll be speaking about the spiritual world of children. So this podcast is a follow-up to my parenting series that I started before Ramadan and I'm continuing it now so that you can have a comprehensive understanding of the life of children from an Islamic perspective. So a common question I often receive from people is if everyone is born with a Qareen jinn devil with them, then how does that Qareen interact with a child? And what role do angels play in the life of children? So I'll take a deep dive into it inshallah today because I truly believe that if you know this knowledge, you will see and treat children in such a different way especially if you're a parent and you get frustrated with your children often, you will understand from this perspective why it's important to take into account when you're parenting children the relationship that they have with jinn and angels. So before I jump in, I'd like to kindly ask you as always to like the podcast if you find it beneficial, do share it with people whom you feel could benefit from this knowledge and do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and you'll get notified of future podcasts that I release. And if you're new here, I'd like to welcome you to the channel. Do go through the podcasts in order whenever you have time and I pray that you find them helpful. So I'm going to start off with explaining the role of angels in the lives of humans. And they primarily have two roles. The first is to protect us and the second is to record our good and bad deeds. In Surah Al-Infatar, Ayah 10 to 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ Which means, You are certainly observed by vigilant, honourable angels recording everything they know, whatever it is that you do. So Allah uses the word katibin, which means two. There are two angels on each shoulder and they record the good and the bad that we do. And all of it gets written in the book that we are presented with on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions these two angels in Surah Qaf. In Ayah 17 to 18, where he says, إِذَا يَتَلَقَّ الْمُتَلَقِّيَانِ عَنِ الْيَمِينِ وَعَنِ الشِّمَالِ قَعِيدٌ مَا يَلْفِظُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ Which means, there are two recording angels, one sits to the right and one sits to the left, and they note everything. Not a word does a person utter without having a vigilant observer ready to write it down. So Raqib is the angel who observes and Atid is the angel who writes everything down. So I'd like you to notice here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will only hold you accountable for your actions and what you say. He doesn't hold you accountable for your thoughts because many of those thoughts come from waswas of the jinn devil. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word ma yalfidhu which means you're only accountable for what you say and what you do. So if you have evil thoughts and you do not act upon them, they won't be written down. But if you have evil thoughts and you act upon them, they will be written in your book of bad deeds. Okay, so just wanted to make that clear because many people also ask me, you know, we we have so many bad thoughts and we're so worried that we will be accountable for them because some of those thoughts are really bad. Sometimes those thoughts are you know, evil and bad about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and bad about our parents and so on and so forth, you know, will we be accountable for them? The answer is no, if you do not act upon the evil thoughts and the waswas that you receive from your qareen, okay? So it's actually a good sign that you feel guilty for your bad thoughts, but as long as you don't act upon them, you're still in a safe space, alhamdulillah. Now, when it comes to the angels who protect us, There are many hadiths about these angels. But in summary, we have an angel who walks in front of us and an angel who walks behind us. And both of them change shifts at Fajr and Asr. And they change shifts with other angels in heaven. So when you go to pray Fajr, the angel swaps with another angel. And when you go to pray Asr, there's an exchange that happens there too. 
So this happens by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because your record is actually taken up to Allah every day at Fajr and Asr. And the wisdom behind it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to forgive you. So if an angel leaves you and goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your record at Fajr, Allah asks the angel, how did you leave this person? And the angel will say, I left this person praying Fajr. And the other angel will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I found this person praying Fajr. And the same applies to Asr. So they will report to Allah that they left you praying Asr and they found you praying Asr. And that's why Fajr and Asr are the two most important prayers of the day. And it distinguishes those who are hypocrites from those who are not because the true believers have no problem praying both. And when I say that, I mean praying them on time. So it's really important that these two prayers in particular are prayed on time so that you do not miss your record being taken up to Allah and have you be registered as someone who was seen praying at that time and on time. Because the opposite case would be that the angel will go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, unfortunately, I left this person playing video games at the time of Asr or I left them still sleeping at the time of Fajr. And so you miss out on the forgiveness that you could actually receive for your sins that day because you were not present in those two prayer times. A man said to Ali ibn Abi Talib عنهم, that a group from the tribe of Murad wanted to kill him. And Ali, عنه, he responded and said, with every man, there are two angels who protect him from everything that is not decreed. When the decree comes, they withdraw and do not stand between them and the decree. And when I say decree, it could mean harm or it could mean death, right? Your appointed time to leave the dunya. So essentially, a person's decreed lifespan is in their protection from the angels. So they only step back when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed the decree. So these two angels will save you from so many disasters, calamities, crises, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees that you are to be harmed in a specific situation because there's a lesson for you to learn behind it. For example, you're very reckless with driving. You don't care about the lives of people on the road or on the motorway and you're speeding, you keep breaking the speed limit. And one day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks the angels to step back because the decree that he has appointed for you is that you have a car accident and it could be quite a bad car accident to stop you speeding so that you do not harm other people or maybe kill other people because of your reckless driving. So it's never a punishment but rather something to stop you from doing something reckless or to stop you from a greater harm, okay? So anything that happens to you in your life that harms you, it's via Allah's divine decree, it's by Allah's will, and there will be a lesson or protection from a greater harm from that. Okay, Even if it's an illness, even if it's a marriage not going ahead, even if it's you stubbing your toe, <laughs> there's a reason behind that harm happening to you because it could be the erasing of sins, it could be redemption it could be anything we don't know only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows but there's always a reason for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requesting the angels to step back so if you have not been given a decree of harm or death then the angels are protecting you these angels that change shifts at Fajr and Asr are always there protecting you okay and this is why it's so important to create an environment in your life that is pleasing for angels, okay? Because there are many things that people do that repel the angels from their life and it actually reduces their ability to protect you in the way they actually can, okay? There are things that you will do in the presence of angels that will cause them to leave or cause them to stand back from you, okay? And what's the evidence for this? There is a hadith narrated by Aisha, radiallahu anha. This is just an example of one of the things that can repel or upset the angels, where she said, Jibreel, alayhi salam, 
made a promise with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to come at a specific hour. And that hour came, but he did not visit him. There was a staff in the hand of the Prophet ﷺ and he threw it from his hand and said, Never does Allah back out of his promise, nor do his messengers. Then he noticed a puppy under his bed and he said, Oh Aisha, when did this dog enter? And she said, By Allah, I don't know. He then commanded her that it should be taken out of the home. No sooner than had they taken it out, Jibreel السلام, came and the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said, you promised to visit me. I waited for you, but you did not come. And Jibreel السلام, responded and said, The dog kept me from coming. We do not enter a house in which there is a dog or pictures. So it's very important for you to study and know the different things that you can do in your daily life that can prevent you from having the full protection of the angels. Okay, so a lot of people think that having a pet dog in the house isn't a big deal and that, you know, dogs are lovely and all of that, but the angels don't like to be in their presence. So when they're outside, it's out of your control. You know, you see them in the street, in the park, that's not a problem. The angels will still be with you. But when you choose to have them in the home, you really do harm yourself by removing the protection of the angels from you while you're at home. Okay, and that's why so many accidents happen in the house because people have pet dogs and loads of things go wrong. And it's the reason why Muslim believers can't have dogs in the home. You can keep them out of the home as guard dogs and whatnot, but not in the home. So I just wanted to use that example because it just gives you a comprehensive understanding of why these angels are so important to us on a day to day basis. And why it's important to do things that keep them around us, like reading Quran, because the angels can't recite Quran. So when you recite Quran, they love to be around you. When you seek knowledge, when you're in the presence of good people, they love to be around you. So there's actually a series by Dr. Amr Suleiman about the angels. He dives very deeply into it. So I advise you to find some time in Charlotte to listen to that, because it is absolutely beautiful especially the lecture about Jibreel alayhi salam it's about three hours long but worth it worth listening to now when it comes to the jinn as we know everyone is born with a qareen and this qareen is a soldier of iblis so they are all evil the only person who did not have an evil qareen was the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam because his mission was a particularly difficult mission as he wasn't just sent to his people with the message of Islam, like the other prophets were, but he was sent with a global mission. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Saba, Ayah 28, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And we have not sent you except to all of mankind as a bringer of good tidings and as a warner, but most of the people do not know. So there's a whole chapter in the Quran dedicated to the jinn, Surah Al-Jinn. And in this surah we understand that there are evil jinn and good jinn, believing jinn and non-believing jinn, because the jinn have free will. So the jinn can also, you know, make a choice of submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or submitting to Iblis. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Jinn, Ayah 14, وَأَنَّا مِنَّ الْمُسْلِمُونَ وَمِنَّ الْقَاسِطُونَ فَمَنْ أَسْلَمَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ تَحَرَّوا رَشَدًا So the jinn are saying, And among us are those who have submitted to Allah and those who are deviant. So as for those who submitted, it is they who have attained the right guidance. Okay, so many of the jinn follow the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Okay, they follow all of that. And how do we know they have families and children and tribes? We know that from the scholars who studied the life of Suleiman salam, who was able to interact with the jinn and he controlled the jinn. He had armies of jinn. And we also know so much about the jinn from the story of Queen Sheba. That's also related to the story of Suleiman salam. Okay, so there are scholars such as At-Tabari, who questioned the full humanity of Malika Tseba, of Queen Sheba, and argued that she was actually human on her father's side and a jinn from her mother. So she was actually a jinn princess. 
okay? Now, this is a whole other subject, and this is why, you know, this is some evidence that people can be half gin and half human, and it's another podcast, inshallah, for another day, but it's really important for people to understand who the jinn are, and what their roles are, and what the roles of angels are, so that you can understand the life of children, okay? So this might be basic information for many of you, but for those who don't have this knowledge, it's very important for me to start off the podcast with highlighting the the roles of these creations, right? The angels are made from light, the jinn are made from a smokeless fire, both are unseen, and in the spiritual realm, angels have thousands of jobs, but in our lives, they have two roles, okay? And it's the same with the jinn. There are jinn who have thousands of roles and thousands of different things that they do. Some fly, some don't, some can um, morph into another creation like a cat or a dog or a human being. Some can possess humans, okay? So different jinn have different abilities as well. And like I said, this is knowledge taken from the works of scholars, okay, the research of scholars, and also from Rukia practitioners who deal with the jinn and who, you know, deal with people who are possessed by them. So we have come to know in our modern day life that the jinn have families, the jinn have tribes, and the jinn, you know, they are affected by us in various ways and so on and so forth, and that we can also be affected by them. So I wanted to just give this introduction so you can understand the importance of knowing this information before I dive into the subject of how children interact with them. So let's start with the Qareen. Now the Qareen is with every child, okay? every baby, every toddler, everyone. The difference between their interaction with their Qareen and our interaction with our Qareen is that if they pass away before the age of puberty, they're not accountable for anything, right? They're not accountable for sins and mistakes and their wrongdoings because they're still learning. And it's their parents' responsibility to teach them right from wrong. So the Qareen actually has no authority or power over children, right? They just, they're dormant. They're dormant during this time. And instead of wasting their time by trying to corrupt the children they try to corrupt the adults through the children now with adults the qareen has authority and power because if you submit to your qareen and when i say you i mean your nafs if your nafs submits to your qareen and that's the waswas right that's the whisperings of the things that they tell you to do if you submit to those things those evil things that go against allah's rule then you have basically handed over power to your qareen and this qareen now affects you directly okay this qareen has the ability to completely corrupt you directly unlike children who are actually used as pawns by the qareen to corrupt the adults corrupt the parents so how is this done right how is this done the qareen if the child is not protected and most children are not because if you're looking at non-muslim children or Muslim children who do not have parents who read adhkar over them, you know, protective dua over them, they're going to be affected by the qareen in a way where the qareen actually irritates them. And it's a reason why some children cry for no reason whatsoever. So they're comfortable, they're not hot, they're not cold, they've been fed, they've had their nap, they're not ill, but they just cry. Or they have their tantrums for no reason. And it can go on for hours and hours and hours. It's actually the qareen irritating them. And when the qareen irritates them, it drives the parent insane. Okay, so what happens when a parent is driven insane? Like, oh, I wish I didn't have kids. Oh, why did God curse me with children? Oh, I never wanted to have kids and I'm now dealing with this. And sometimes it causes the parents to physically discipline the child. Sometimes it causes a parent to abandon their child. Okay, how many fathers have we heard doing that where they just walk out? They're like, I'm not dealing with this. I'm not built to be a dad. I don't want to deal with kids' tantrums. Adios. And he'll take off. This is what the Qareen wants, you see. When they irritate the children and when the parents don't have any patience, it actually causes marital problems. It causes 
the home to break down by increasing the level of stress and increasing the chances of abuse taking place towards the child. And when you abuse children, you're collecting sins. When you're now arguing over the children and you're stressed and you're having marital problems because this child keeps having a tantrum, this child keeps getting irritated for no reason whatsoever, the Qareen has fulfilled their mission. Okay, through the child, they attack you. So whenever you have a child who seems to be crying for no reason or is very irritable for no reason and it's driving you insane, it's causing you to lose the will to live, read Athkar over that child and have Surat al-Baqarah playing in the room where the child is. Okay, because it will tame the Qareen. Raqya never gets rid of the Qareen. Okay, I'm going to do a whole podcast about that and how many Raqis, they um, scam people into believing that they have gotten rid of someone's Qareen. Okay, you can never get rid of your Qareen with Raqya, but you can tame the Qareen. You can make them mellow down so much that they don't affect you. So it's important that you do this. So the protective angels over that child can only do so much. Because we are instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to read our adhkar, right? We have to read Quran, we have to read the protective verses, and we have to make dua for protection, okay? We have to be proactive in our own protection too. So when we pray, we pray for protection. When we make dua, we make dua for our protection, right? So it's important that Muslim parents also do this for their children because their children are unaware of it. Right, they're now dependent on you to be making this du'a for them and to be reading the adhkar for them. So if you're not reading Qur'an over them, if you're not doing this as a daily practice for them, there's only so much the angels can do to protect the children. Okay, so angels work hand in hand with the protection of du'a. And you might say, well, if harm is to come to the child, it will come from divine decree. This is true. However, if you leave the house without reading your protective du'a, or if you don't say your adhkar, whenever you start driving, for example, and something happens, you also have a hand in that. Okay, because the Prophet Muhammad said you've got to protect yourself from evil jinn as well. So you've got the divine decree which you have no control over, but you do have control over the amount of protection you have from evil jinn. And so you need to protect those under your care and who depend on you from the evil jinn as well. And it's a duty of Muslim parents to be doing this for their children. So another example I can give you of this irritation that the Qareen causes children is actually seen in the mosque. So, and I see it very often when I go to the masjid, as soon as the imam says Allahu Akbar to start a prayer, all the babies start crying, <laughs> all the toddlers start crying and you'll be standing in salah and the imam is reciting and all you can hear are children crying and it comes from this, it comes from the irritation of the qareen and you might be asking, okay, how can that happen in a mosque? It can happen because the children aren't protected with intention. So when you read du'a and adhkar, you have to read it with the intention of protecting that child. You'll see some children who are not crying and many children who are. And it's always the majority of children who are not protected by the good intention of adhkar that creates a barrier between them and the evil jinn. I mean, ask yourselves, did you this morning when you woke up, did you read an adhkar over your children to protect them from the evil jinn? Most of you will say no. And that's why so many children, even in a mosque setting, will be affected by the Qareen. And the Qareen does this to distract the adults from their salah. And so you become irritable and anxious. And you're, you're just thinking about this child who won't stop crying. You're not focusing on the salah. There's no khushur. And that's the mission of the Qareen in that moment in time. And so even the people who have protected children who are not crying will be affected and they'll get distracted as well right they will be irritable in their salah because they can't focus and that's why it's actually more islamic for women in particular to not take their children to the mosque if they know they have a 
tendency to cry or, you know, cause distractions. Because children really do, especially in Jum'ah prayer. So it's always a wonderful thing to take your children to the mosque. But if you've got babies and toddlers, it's actually more Islamic for you to stay at home with them and pray there than distract other people with the cries of your children. Okay, because it's the qareen. They poke them. They poke them and they irritate them to cause them to all cry. At the same time, they would have been fine before the adhan, fine before the first Allahu Akbar. Then all of a sudden, subhanAllah, they all start crying. I want you to notice it the next time you go to Jum'ah prayer. And please do read the adhkar over your children because the qareen does affect them. Okay, the, the qareen does irritate them. And that's why they cry for hours. Okay, protect them from that distress. And I've actually noticed the crying is particularly bad in Masjid al-Haram, but not as bad in Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina. Now, another major thing that many Muslims forget to do is to read the dua at the time of intercourse. Okay, so the Prophet Muhammad said that a Muslim should say before he commences intercourse with his wife, Bismillahi Allahumma jannibna shaytan wa jannib shaytan ma razaqtana. Okay, in the name of Allah, shield us from Satan and keep him away from us and from what you may bestow upon us in children. Okay, this is in Bukhari. So, this is a dua that has to be read before a man sleeps with his wife, especially when it's with the intention for her to get pregnant so that the child will not be harmed by the shaitan, okay? Now, in this situation, it's not actually Iblis who is going to harm the child, it's going to be one of his soldiers, okay? So when the Prophet ﷺ says a shaitan, he means one of the evil jinn devils, okay? Now, in this situation, it will be the ashiq jinn, okay? It's the ashiq jinn, who gets involved in sexual matters. The Ashiq Jinn is assigned for any mission in regards to someone's sexuality or sexual relations. And so it's very real that a child, before they're even born, can be affected by an evil jinn. Okay, because the parents were careless with this dua. And this is the start of their spiritual journey. So if the Ashiq Jinn gets involved, right, finds an entrance into this relationship now, the Ashiq Jinn can now possess the mother. And the way the Ashiq Jinn enters someone is via sexual activity. So if a man has not read the dua, or if even she hasn't read the dua for herself, the Ashiq Jinn can find a way in. And this is why in Islam, self-pleasure or masturbation is forbidden, because it gives an entrance for the ashiq jinn to possess somebody. Okay, so people who promote this self-pleasure and they say it's not haram and there's no evidence to say it's haram and all of that, they are misguiding people into a very big problem. Okay, the ashiq jinn has entered most people via sexual activity like masturbation and not reading the dua before you have sexual intercourse. And it can also enter you while you're watching pornography, okay? Because you're in a very vulnerable sexual state of being and it can corrupt your mind so you actually become addicted to pornography. And of course, as we all know, that people will be afflicted by the ashiq jinn if they're engaging in zina. So if you're engaging in zina, you're going to be a prime target for the ashiq jinn. So if you have any children born out of zina, they're always going to have spiritual problems, okay? So what happens to children if their mother has been afflicted by the ashiq jinn? Well, they can actually be affected by that in pregnancy. So children are very susceptible to the energy of the people around them and the energy of the jinn around them. So they're like a sponge, okay? They can soak in so much negative and positive energy. So when a child is in the womb, they can be affected by the ashiq jinn. And one of the signs of a child who has been affected by the ashiq jinn from pregnancy and because there was no dua read at the time of conception 
is their natural inclination to information about sex. Okay, so you'll find children as young as four and five very fascinated with the subject of sex. And they might have seen things pop up on their iPads, you know, while they're watching something on YouTube. And they will have a very deep interest in what they've seen, okay? They might have seen a clip of a naked woman or a naked man and they want to know more. Whereas many other children, they're not interested, right? They're not interested in any of that. It scares them, okay? A normal child will actually be scared of seeing something like that pop up and they'll be like, oh, what was that? You know, I didn't like what I just saw because they're protected, but children who are not protected at all will have this very strange interest in sex from a very, very young age. Some might even play with themselves from a very young age. And they are also more inclined to have romantic feelings for children of the same gender. Okay, you'll see that. And this is why many psychologists and scientists have said that it is possible for children to be born homosexual. They are not born homosexual. Every child is born upon the fitra. But because they have been afflicted by the ashiq jinn from pregnancy and because of no dua being read to protect them, they have now got these strange feelings and desires that all come from the ashiq jinn. Remember, I have mentioned in previous podcasts that homosexuality comes from the ashiq jinn and it can come from a very young age. Okay, so scientists have found no explanation for it, except that they have come to the conclusion that there will be people who are born homosexual because they've seen homosexual tendencies in children. Okay, children who are going against their fitra are afflicted by a jinn because normal children will still have romantic feelings for children of the opposite gender And they won't be so obsessed about sex or anything like that. They'll be innocent. The ashiq jinn makes them the way they are. Okay? And this is the explanation for why many psychologists have said that this is something children are born with. They are not born with it. They're not born with it. It's a spiritual problem. And if you nip it in the bud quickly, you can actually get rid of it for them. You can get rid of it by, again, reading the athkar, putting Surah Al-Baqarah on, you know, doing Ruqya on them, all of that. It will help them, especially if you start teaching them too how to read their own adhkar and how to recite Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah al nas Surah Al-Falaq, all of these things. So it's really important that you take note of this as a parent because, like I said, a lot of people will make this mistake of not taking the first step to protect their children and then you expose them to spiritual problems that you have no idea about, right? It's not something you can see and you'll never understand it. It's something that you'll always be baffled about and if scientists have been baffled about it, then parents will definitely be because they don't understand where this obsession with sex comes from in such young children and why boys are inclined to boys at school and so on, okay? So that's one side of the spiritual world that they experience if they have been exposed to the ashaq jinn from a very young age and way before they were born. So again, people might ask, well, why don't the angels protect them? Because they're innocent babies and they're innocent toddlers. The reason why is because, again, we have a degree of responsibility to those under our care. Okay, there are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to learn. And through these experiences, we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan and wisdom okay we trust that Islam is the truth because when we read about the ashaq jinn and when we read about what can happen if you don't read your adhkar but we don't implement it and then we see the consequences of it it will help us in our iman okay these things can always be fixed inshallah but the angels are not going to save every child because there's a degree of responsibility we have towards children. And if you look at the bigger picture of all these children dying in Gaza, for example, is it because angels are failing to protect them or is it because humans have failed to protect the children? So we have to tie our camel first, right? We have to protect the children as humans first before the angels do their work. We can't always rely on angels to do the work for us okay we've been given 
a mission and we've been given instructions on how to protect ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show us that if you do not take the initiative to protect yourselves and protect your children from the evil jinn, shayateen al-ins and shayateen al-jinn, this is what's going to happen to children. This is what's going to happen. Because if angels were to save every child, then why would we ever read Athkar? Why would we ever read Quran? Why would we ever even make dua if the angels are always going to save us and save the children? So Allah wants us to know that if you want the protection of the angels, you need to be making the effort first. And we are in this situation now as a global ummah because the humans have failed in their own protection. I promise you, that's what it is. We have failed as an ummah to protect each other. And that's why children are in this situation. That's why children are being killed left, right and centre because the humans have failed to protect them. And humans will be accountable for that. Yeah, we can't rely on the angels to do that. Yes, they're there to protect us, but we have a duty also to protect ourselves and each other. And we have been given the tools to be able to do that in Islam. Now, another part of the spiritual world that many children experience is the spiritual world of those who have passed away and left young children behind. Children have an ability to connect with people who have passed away and this is done via dreams okay so this is actually split into two parts so you get some very young children I'm talking under the age of four who still don't talk okay they're not talking they're not verbal and they may have lost a mother or a father and a lot of people in the non-muslim world believe in ghosts right? So they might say, oh, I saw the ghost of my grandmother, or I saw the ghost of my grandfather, or my mother who passed away. And in Islam, we know that ghosts don't exist, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never mentioned them, and they are not mentioned in hadith. So essentially, what actually happens is when people see ghosts of people who have passed away, then they're essentially seeing the jinn, okay? So the jinn will mess with people's heads by appearing as people who have passed away. Because remember I told you that there are many evil jinns who can impersonate other creations. And some of them can impersonate people who have passed away. And this is actually one of the greatest tools of the Dajjal that he will use to manipulate people into believing he is God because he will have an army of evil jinns who will appear as people who have died so that people are manipulated into believing that he is God because only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring the dead back to life. So he will order the jinn to impersonate people who have passed away and many people will submit to the Dajjal believing that he is indeed uh, God. So believing in ghosts is actually one of Iblis's manipulation tactics to mess with your head, okay? Because these evil jinns can say anything to you if they appear as you know, your grandfather, for example, who passed away, this evil jinn might come and say something and it could be harmful for you. It could be disturbing for you. Um, you might find that you see an evil jinn resembling someone whom you loved very much and they're telling you that they're being thrown in the hellfire or they're being punished and it's going to disturb you and give you horrible nightmares. And they do this to mess with your mental health. Okay, so if you ever see a ghost of someone who has passed away, know that that's a jinn, and just say, A'udhu Billahi min ash rajim and inshallah they will disappear. Okay, because the Prophet Muhammad told us that once a human passes away and leaves this dunya, they can never come back to it. Okay, there is no return for them to this dunya. They go to the spiritual grave of the barzakh. And the barzakh is where you either rest in your grave or you are tortured in your grave. So you leave your physical body behind in the dunya. But the actual punishment of the grave or the rewards of the grave happen in the barzakh. And no one knows in the barzakh what happens to people in the dunya until someone after them passes away and brings them the news of this dunya and the people within it. So you will never find anyone come back to this dunya to observe or, you know, look down upon people and what they're doing and, and all of that. 
And one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids them from coming back is because it's an actual mercy for the people who are living in the dunya so that their loved ones are not watching them sin. Okay, so let's say, for example, someone's, you know, parents passed away and they were righteous people and their son, who's still alive, is someone who is addicted to pornography. So if they were to come down to this dunya so that they can watch over their loved ones, they're going to be disturbed watching them sin, right? You don't want to see your kids doing things like this or what your ex-wife is up to or who your widowed husband married. It's actually a mercy for those who passed away to not see all of these things. And it's also a mercy for the people in this dunya to not be exposed in sin to those who loved them and passed away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a barrier between the two worlds to protect, to protect us. Okay, we're protected and they're protected from harm and hurt. So a lot of children under the age of four who have been orphaned or they've lost a mother or they've lost maybe a twin, okay, at birth, they will not understand why their mother suddenly disappeared or why their father suddenly disappeared. And they will be in a lot of discomfort, especially newborn babies who might find it difficult to sleep without seeing their parent or smelling their parent or hearing their parent. So what happens here is they will either get dreams or angels and the good jinn will impersonate their parents to comfort them. Okay, so I've posted a video below in the description box of a child who is, it's almost if they're communicating with their mother at the grave. And a lot of people see children under the age of four do this. So if you go to visit a grave, you might actually see a child talk to their deceased parent like there's actually someone there but because we know that it cannot be the person who is deceased okay because this might be weeks or months later we know that they're in the barzakh the only explanation for it is that they are communicating with the good jinn and angels because angels can also impersonate people so it's a comfort for these children who don't know they don't understand and it gets them through life. It gets them through that loss. So they might say to you, oh, mama's over there. Or you might ask them, who are you talking to? And you'd be like, mama, it's mama's over there. And they might even hug and kiss the air because they're seeing someone there. So this is the empathic jinn or the angels who are there protecting them and comforting them. Okay, this is especially when they're not verbal yet. And many troubled children as well will also see the good jinn and they'll see angels and that's why you find them just gazing into a corner and laughing for no reason whatsoever. They're just looking at something you can't see and it's making them laugh or it's making them smile. And you'll find also that their eyes follow something around the room and it's usually the angels, okay? So when you see a child just being complete happiness by themselves... It's because angels are entertaining them and so are the good jinn. And you might even be holding a baby, but you're unable to maintain eye contact with this baby because they're so distracted with what's going on in the corner of a room where there's nothing. And you'll also find that when you hold babies, they like to tip their heads backwards and look at the ceiling. And it's again because they see angels and, and beautiful things. And you'll also notice with children under four who are not verbal... They will be drawn to particular people in the street or in gatherings and family parties because they can actually see angels in the presence of the people and they can also see angels in human form. So there are some angels who are sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a mission among the people. Okay, now this angel might be in the form of a beggar. They might be, you know, there for a specific mission, but children can identify them. Children under four in particular can identify them. And the reason why it's only identifiable by non-verbal children is because adult humans are not meant to know who they are. Okay, so children are unable to tell their parents and tell adults who these angels in human form are because they are meant to be hidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So 
it's the non-verbal children who see them and animals also see them okay so you'll also find many autistic children who have speech issues when they're young see them a lot so if you see your children being very drawn to someone in particular then know that this person's nefs is on a very high level okay it's on a very high vibration and this person is surrounded by angels so empaths, high level empaths are surrounded by many angels, okay, angels like to be in the presence of empaths, so children become fascinated when they see empaths because they see so many angels around them as well, and it will be a natural inclination to those empaths, so it's not because the empath has bribed them with a sweet, no, it's a natural inclination where children really enjoy being in the presence of those empathic people. So when I'm out and about, I love to observe children. I love observing their behavior and I see this pattern in all of them. Okay, it's just, it's just mind blowing. I find it amazing. Now, the second part of this, because remember I told you this is split into two, is the children above the age of four who are verbal and can express to adults what they see in the spiritual world. So you'll find that as they get older, the ability to see spiritual beings like the jinn, the good jinn and angels becomes less and less and less. And the reason for this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that if children were to express everything they see in the spiritual world, it can actually cause their parents to panic and sometimes lose their deen. Especially if these children keep telling their parents that they are seeing the deceased. Okay, so over time, the iman of the parents might actually chip away because they're now doubting what's been said about the barzakh. Okay, if their children are seeing the deceased on a daily basis and, and whatnot. So it's actually to protect people's iman by decreasing the amount of times or the exposure children have to the spiritual world as they become more verbal. Because not everyone has the ability to process and accept all of this. I mean, one of the things that my mother told me when I was young, I must have been about three or four. She said I would have periods where I would just go dead silent. So she'd be doing something and she'd leave me in a playpen or something. And she said, you just go dead quiet. And then she'd come in to check on me. And um, she'd go and sit in a chair. There was a, a huge armchair in the corner of the room. I still remember it. And she would go and sit there. And I would tell her, Mum, no, don't sit there. There's a lady sitting there and she's reading to me. So it was at the time when I just started talking and expressing myself. But I managed to communicate to my mother that there's a lady sitting there in that chair. And she was disturbing her, you know, because she's reading to me and you're in her place. And... Because my mom was religious and she understands the spiritual world and everything, she didn't freak out. She was like, okay, there's, there's something here, there's a spirit here and it's causing you know, my daughter to be calm and it's giving her comfort. So lots of these spirits come into the lives of children to give them comfort and sometimes they'll do things like read to them, or sing to them and it can bother parents, it can really freak out a lot of parents who think that their children are going crazy and that there's something majorly wrong with them and that they want to go and take them for a brain scan and a psychology appointment. And a lot of people do that when their children inform them that there's a spirit there or there's a lady there or there's a man there or there are children there that they can't see. And this is the work of the Qareen to make the parents, you know, lose their iman or believe there's something wrong with the child and then put children through unnecessary distress by taking them for scans and psychology appointments. There's no need for any of that, okay? This is what children go through. It's what they see. But when you don't understand it, you will think there's something majorly wrong with this child who's hallucinating and, you know, seeing strange things all over the house. And now you're freaked out thinking your house is full of ghosts and gin and you can't sleep and now you've got spiritual problems yourself. Can you see how this is from the Qareen? to affect you and this is one of the reasons why as a child becomes more verbal the ability for them to see spiritual things would decrease to protect the parents so that you do not have iman issues as a result of what the child is telling you and children who have parents who are spiritual 
are more likely to experience more spiritual phenomena because the parents don't freak out and their iman is not affected. And that's what happened to me when I was younger. Another thing that happened to me when I was younger is I used to go to my nan's house, Allah Arhamha. She lived in Mecca, very close to the Haram. And we used to go with my cousins. So my aunties would come with their children and we'd all go every Friday to visit my nan. Now, when we used to get there, one of my cousins used to always stare at the roof of my nan's house and he would sit there and gaze at it for a very long time. And we'd ask him, you know, what what are you looking at? We can't see anything. And he's like, I can see ladies up there and they're waving at me. So we just thought he was making it up, right? We were between the ages of six to ten. And by that age, you lose a lot of your spiritual vision. So you no longer see these things unless you're very spiritually disturbed. And I'll come on to that in a moment. But in this age bracket, you don't really see much. And you'll also forget what you've seen before. So it's only because my mother told me what I used to say to her when I used to see the lady in the house that I'm able to speak about it but I actually would have forgotten all about it and most people do so most adults would have actually seen things when they were younger as children but they've forgotten about it because they never spoke about it so they've got no one to remind them of what they used to see so going back to my cousin he used to sing some short songs that we weren't familiar with and we hadn't learnt them in school so we had no idea what he was singing but one day My nan heard him sing and she said to him, where on earth did you learn that song? And he said, the lady is on the roof taught it to me. And she said, it was such an ancient Arabic song from like 7th century Arabia because of the language used. The Arabic that was used in the song he was singing was from ancient Arabia. Like it's not something a child would know in this day and age. And she said, my nan was very spiritual, so she said, you know, there are jinn, there are jinn in this area. And because a lot of ghazawat happened in that area, the jinn will try to mess with people's head. So she taught my cousin how to say, but they weren't harmful jinn. It's just the jinn love to play, right? The jinn's entertainment is impersonating people from the past. You know, you get people going to Hampton Court and saying that they saw Henry VIII and you know, they saw Guy Fawkes and they saw all sorts of people. So it's the jinn's game to impersonate people from many different generations. So I remember my mum told me that that song my cousin was singing gave them all goosebumps because they're like, where did you learn that ancient Arabic? And he's like, I hear it all the time from the women who sing on the roof. So you know, children are exposed to these things. And if my nan was not spiritual, if my mom was not spiritual, they would have freaked out. They really would have freaked out and they would have got a raqi into the house, you know, doing all sorts of ruqya and spraying salt and exterminating the jinn. You know, people who freak out will do that. But they just said, you know, they just told us, just say, regime. if you ever see something strange like that, just say this, read these afkars. And we were never scared of the jinn growing up. Like, it's not something to be scared of when you know how to deal with them. And so this is something that I learned from a very young age. And why I know it's important for children to be raised with this knowledge and to get into the daily practice of reading their afkar and protective dua. Now, the children above the age of four who are verbal, who see disturbing jinn, that comes as a result of the environment they live in. Okay, it comes as a result of them living with lots of narcissists and especially the malignant ones. So they might see scary shadows in their room. They might see evil looking creatures at night that give them nightmares. All of these come as a result of the spiritual problems that the people in their lives have. And so when they tell you that they've seen scary things or shadows or whatever it is that they see, take it seriously. Take it seriously with dua and athkar and ruqya. Because unfortunately, this is one of the consequences of staying in a marriage with a narcissistic person, especially if they're malignant, especially if they're possessed. Okay, if you know they're possessed, if you know they've got jinn issues, 
your children unfortunately are going to suffer if they're not empathic. So not all children will grow up to be you know, empathic children. Some will be narcissistic. Some will take on the traits of their father or their mother who's malignant. Some of them will be codependent and some of them will be toxic codependent. So you will find children, when they start to become verbal, they start to, you know, build their characters. And they build their characters upon what they find works. So if they see that the narcissistic character of their father is more appealing because he's powerful and controlling and everyone listens to him and everyone's scared of him, that child is going to lean more towards copying the narc traits of the father. And if a child sees that, you know, the more empathic parent has nicer traits, they're more loving and caring and quiet, then they will decide to take on those traits and build their character on that, okay, on that empathy. So sometimes if children adopt the narc traits of their father, they will attract, unfortunately, the dark spirits of their father as well. And they will start to have disturbing dreams and they will start to see, you know, things here and there in the house. Um, a lot of people think that these children are going crazy. Again, they need psychological help and brain scans and all that. No, please take it seriously when children complain to you about seeing things. You have to take the initiative of protecting them spiritually with your adhkar and dua, okay? Especially when you're living with malignant narcs. I'm I can't say it enough. I can't say it enough because these malignant narcs already have spiritual problems. So if you're not reading daily adhkar, they're going to be affected by the jinn those narcs have because they jump between each other. And that's why sometimes you'll see your own children have very bad mood swings one minute they're lovely and sweet and then the next minute they are satan spawn right they are damien children horrible children and it's like they switch it's because there's a spiritual transference here between the the dark spirits of the narcissist in the family and them because they've chosen to take on their traits and become like them and you'll find that the empathic children aren't really affected by the dark spirits because the empathic children understand that this is the better way to be, right? They're more empathic and they're doing more to stay away from the narc parent. They might isolate themselves. They might go and sit in their rooms. Like even if the child is five or six, they'll avoid the narc in the family. And that's how they protect themselves. So they have the protection of the angels. But when you have a child who is hell bent on being like their father and copying their father and starting to become a bully like their father and speak like their father, I'm using father as an example, this could be mother too, then you will notice that the angels would disperse from around them because angels do not like to be around malignant narcs. If you are in the presence of a malignant narc, you will not have angels there. Because their spirit is so bad, the angels can't be around it. It's too dark. And you'll find that's why the dark spirits are passed on to the children and they fluctuate between very bad mood swings. Okay, that's the explanation for it. So you've got to be careful. Try and take your children out of that environment. You know, I always say to people, if you can get out of a relationship like that, it's best for you to get out. You know, it's best for you to get out if the narcissist is not getting active help to, you know, resolve their issues, their spiritual issues and their personality disorder problems. If they're not getting the self-help they need, they're lazy about it or they're adamant on not going to therapy. You know, you've really got to think twice about staying with that person because you'll never be in the presence of angels around these people. And they will affect your children if those children are more inclined to be narcissistic. Okay, that's why you find many people complain about their daughters and their sons being an absolute nightmare to deal with when they have a narcissistic parent. And, you know, I have so many clients who tell me, my daughter, she's only seven, but she is making my life an absolute hell. She's exactly like her father. Or I've got a, a nine-year-old daughter and she's exactly like her mother. So rude, so disgusting in her behavior she doesn't listen she's so disrespectful she swears she this she that it's because she's taken on the dark spirits of her father or her mother who is a malignant narcissist okay so the the protection of the angels is not there it might be there but it's very weak so it's a very complicated situation 
when someone cannot leave such a relationship. But this is the explanation for it. And that's why when you take children out of the home, they're so much better. Don't you find that their mood gets better? And as soon as they step into the home, they become horrid again. Horrible people. It's because the angels have taken a step back. There's no protection there anymore. The same way they do not like to step into a home where there are dogs. Angels do not like to step into a home where there are malignant narcissists who are possessed by their evil jinn. So this is the reason why so many kids get better, so many teenagers get better, so many people get better as soon as they leave the house. And then a lot of people say, oh, someone's done black magic on this family because this person is only nice when they leave the house. As soon as they enter the home, they're horrible people. It's not always black magic. It can be, but it's not always black magic. Sometimes it's because the angels take a step back and the effects of the evil jinn come into play. All right? So that's the explanation for that. So if your children have nightmares, you will know it's because of that. If children under four who are not verbal have nightmares, it's not because they see the evil jinn. Non-verbal children under the age of four do not see evil jinn. Okay, they never see them. If they have nightmares, it's from their subconscious and it's based on what they've seen during the day. So if they've seen their parents scream at each other, fight with each other, if they've seen that evil face that a narcissist makes when they rage, right, when they go into that narcissistic rage and that devilish face comes out, um, if, if, a, if a baby sees that or a toddler sees that, they can have nightmares about it. So... They don't see things. They don't see evil jinn, dark spirits, none of that. They're protected from all of that. They just dream about the negative things they've seen that day. And this, again, happens when they're not protected. So if you're not reading Ayat al-Kursi over them and their adhkar over them before they sleep, they're going to have disturbing dreams about the events of the day. Okay? So please protect them from it because... You might think arguing in front of a baby doesn't affect them, it does. They do have nightmares about it and they can have a very restless sleep because of it. And you might think it's because they're hot or because they're hungry. No, it affects children when they see their parents shout at each other or they hear it, right? It's, it's bad energy. It's bad energy that affects this beautiful energy they have. Because remember, babies and toddlers under the age of four have the purest energy. Okay, it's the energy that's the closest to that of angels, which is why they can see them because they're on the same vibrational level of the angels. Okay, they're pure. They are sinless. They have no flaws. Babies also worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their own way. They're already connected to Allah. They're connected to the angels. Okay, every baby is born with that ability to have a connection with Allah and to know Allah. So even babies and toddlers will have their own remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their own connection with him in ways that we don't understand. So anything that disturbs this energy, because it's so pure, anything that disturbs it affects them and it affects them quite significantly. So babies and children need very quiet, loving, nurturing environments to live in so they can thrive If they don't have those environments to live in, you're going to grow up with children with many spiritual problems. And that's why they become very rebellious when they're older, when they reach teenage years. And when a child is not given the space and the environment to thrive, it gives space for their qareen to take over as soon as they hit puberty. My next podcast, inshallah, will be about what happens when these children reach the age of puberty. Okay, so the Qareen is on standby. He's just waiting. He wants you to be giving this child a very turbulent childhood. Okay, they want you to be, you know, always fighting at home and always screaming and always shouting because you believe it's not really affecting the baby. The baby's too young to understand. It's not about them understanding. Yes, when you're looking at it from a logical perspective, they're not going to understand, but they're being affected energy wise. Okay, their energy is being affected, their spiritual state is being affected. And the more this is affected, the more the qareen will have a hold over them as soon as they hit puberty. And this is one of the major reasons why Iblis and his soldiers love empaths to marry narcissistic people. Because Iblis knows that if empathic women 
marry empathic men, these children will be raised in loving, wonderful homes. And if they are raised to thrive in empathic environments with love and care and nurturing, then the Qareen won't have a hold on them when they're teenagers. Okay, you'll understand it more when, in my next podcast, inshallah. But the Qareen will be so weak by the time this child grows up and hits the age of puberty because they've actually learned how to become comfortable as empaths. Okay, they've got wonderful examples of empathy in behavior. They've got wonderful examples of Muslim parents. They've got wonderful examples of morality. And so when children have that start in life, the Qareen doesn't have a hold on them when they reach the age of puberty. Okay, so Iblis and all his soldiers, they do their absolute best to make sure that the people, the shayateen al-ins, who are the narcissists, yeah, and the psychopaths and the narcopaths and all of them, they equip them with excellent manipulation tactics to reel in empaths who are quite naive, um, empaths who believe everything the narcissists are saying, they believe all the mirroring, right, they believe this person is an empath because they've managed to, you know, imitate the empath's behavior back to them, and so empaths, I'm not talking about high-level empaths, the low-level empaths and the codependents who are empathic in their own ways, when they reel them in, they get caught up in these cycles and marriages with men and women who are not good for them. And then your children end up having a turbulent childhood. And when they have a turbulent childhood, it just gives the gin devils a head start on their control of these children when they reach the age of puberty. Okay, so it's conditioning. It's all programming and conditioning. And this is why it is so incredibly important for empaths to understand all of this so that they never risk it when they marry someone who has red flags. Because your mission in life is to find another empath whom you could start a family with so you can raise these children to, you know, enjoy this beautiful energy they have, okay, that they've been blessed with. And you want to nurture that. You want to nurture in their spiritual vision that they have that's positive. You want them to have good night sleeps and all of that. Now, I'm not saying this to make people feel bad if you're not in this situation. But I'm explaining to you from an Islamic perspective why we have to marry righteous people. Because it affects our children. And when you marry someone righteous, you know, they're not going to be the type who forget the dua, you know, at the time of, you know, sexual intercourse. They're not going to forget these crucial things because, you know... They're going to care about their children. They're going to care about the children to come. And so marrying someone who has a very high level of empathy and love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and love for their future children, yeah, and love for their akhirah that they're working towards is what you need to be aiming for, okay? It's too much of a risk to be marrying people who have red flags. This is what you're going to put your children through, okay? So if you're going through this right now, just take the tips that I'm giving you to inshallah rectify the situation or at least make it better. Okay, you can always improve it by implementing the advice and the tips that I give you inshallah. Okay, so don't despair. It is what it is. Everything happens by, you know, divine decree. So don't beat yourselves up about it. If you're empathic and you've, you know, married a narcissist and you've had kids with them, it's fine. It's okay. Just, you know, you were meant to receive this information at this point in time. And use it to your own benefit, okay? Use it to rectify and try the situation as much as possible. Now, the next thing that a lot of parents would have noticed in many of their children, I would say, again, under the age of 10, is that they have imaginary friends, okay? Not all children, some children. And it's mainly the empathic children, okay? So they'll have a friend who they speak to and laugh with, they'll play their games with, They'll play with their toys with. And it's like there's actually someone there. You've got two different types of empaths who do this. Now, the first type of empath child is the one who has a fascinating and amazing imagination. Okay, so they are acting from imagination, from the cartoons they've watched. Maybe they've seen other children play in a certain way. And 
maybe they're lonely at school. Maybe they don't have brothers and sisters to play with. Maybe they don't have neighbours to play with. So a lot of these empath children, they resort to having an imaginary friend. And you'll find them sitting in their room and playing or talking like there's someone with them. So with these children, it's not a spiritual problem. And it's not a spiritual phenomena that they're going through. It's merely because they've got a fascinating imagination and they are able to create another person and find a way of um, combating loneliness. So they'll still be protected, they'll still have the angels with them, but this is entertainment for them. Okay, sometimes they will get ideas from storybooks and they might like a character in a book and they might you know, bring that character to life as an imaginary friend and call them with the same name and everything. So it's a coping mechanism. And sometimes they use it to escape a toxic environment at home and they use it to deal with bullying at school. So if you see your child have an imaginary friend, it's nothing to panic about when you know the child is very empathic. And sometimes it's a good way of them to self-soothe so they can actually find solutions for their own problems you would have to look into the root causes of why they do this of course if they're being bullied at school you know do look into it if they are escaping from the toxic environment at home this is actually a good thing that they're doing so they already know that what's going on is toxic and they want to be away from it this is a fantastic empathic mindset to have Okay, so you're protecting your peace by going into your room and preferring to have an imaginary friend. Children who do this from a young age are quite mature. Okay, these will grow up to be children who are more mature than their age. Now, the more narcissistic and codependent children will have imaginary friends, but they are imaginary friends from the jinn. Okay, and they will usually be from the good jinn, not the bad jinn. Sometimes it is the bad jinn if the jinn starts to harm the child, but more often than not, it's the good jinn. Now, people forget that there are also jinn children. Okay, so you have the adult jinn, and you have the teenage jinn, and you also have children. So the jinn who often play with the children are also children too. And I've posted a video below. Again, it's just to give you an example of what I mean when, you know, you might see a child actually play with um, a gin child and it really does look like someone is there with them because there's pushing and pulling and, and all of that. There's resistance and things are being knocked about. You can actually see that there really is a spiritual entity there with them. But when you're observing the empath child, you won't notice that. You will see that it's clearly someone from their imagination. But with a narcissistic child or a more codependent child, you will find that the imaginary friend is actually a djinn. Because angels don't play with children in this type of way. And if the djinn is an evil djinn, then it will actually cause the child to do dangerous things around the home. So for example, you know, find a box of matches, light matches, put the gas cooker on. Um, they'll do things that are dangerous around the house and you will wonder, you know, how on earth did they figure out how to do that and why are they doing it frequently? Like this child is driving me crazy. Why do they keep doing dangerous things? It's because they're playing with an evil gen. And if they're just playing with a normal djinn who's not evil, then, you know, it would just be a tug of war between toys. You'll see toys moving around um, and you'll see the child actually arguing with someone or laughing with someone. And you can tell there's a spiritual presence there. OK, so just observe, you know, take it seriously when a child says I've got an imaginary friend. Sometimes they'll introduce the imaginary friend to you or you'll ask them, you know, who's George or who's Sarah? And they'll be like, you know, she's my friend. Can you not see her? Children don't understand why you can't see the gym like they can. They can't understand. So if they're very naughty at home and you feel like they're acting like someone is telling them to do something or they're finding, you know, matches and 
sharp things around the house that are hidden, it's usually the jinn who show them where they are because the jinn love sharp objects and they love shiny objects. So you'll find children playing with scissors a lot. You'll find them playing with sharp objects and you'll be like, how on earth did you find that? Or how did you learn how to use a match? Again, it comes from that, okay? Now, sometimes it can be the outside influence of children at school. But in this situation, I'm talking about children at home who act like they have an imaginary friend. So if you're not sure whether the imaginary friend of your child is a djinn or just from their imagination, just set up a camera in the room where they usually play and just observe what happens. If you see paranormal activity there, you'll know that it's a djinn. If you don't see any, then it's just from their imagination. Okay, so if you're unsure, that's a way of... Um, confirming and like I said you know the video below will show you what I mean when I say that there are children who can play with the jinn and have issues with the jinn and I'll tell you something as well these jinn children do not come out in front of parents and the reason why they do not come out and play with children in front of parents is because they know that if the parents realize that a child is playing with the jinn, the parents might say, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, and they're forced to go away. Okay, because they want to be there. They're having fun. They're having fun hiding things and, and playing and all of that. So they don't come out in front of the parents. And that's why sometimes it takes a parent to set up a camera for them to see what happens when they're not there. So it's to prevent you... From saying adhkar or a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim that burns them and makes them go away. So yeah, so sometimes they will um, just wait until you leave the room or you leave the house. Maybe you leave them with a babysitter who's not really, you know, clued on to these things and they will have their fun with the children. Okay, so there's a reason why you don't see it as an adult. It's because they fear you getting rid of them. Now, the empathic children who use the imaginary friend to escape from their toxic life will use this as a coping mechanism for a very long time. And sometimes this goes into their adulthood. And that's why so many people experience maladaptive daydreaming. And that's when you constantly fantasize about a different life. And you imagine a different life for yourself. So you constantly daydream about you being a different person in a different family, in a different generation. You find yourself preoccupied with that. And now the problem with that is that it takes you away from reality. And instead of you working on your life as it is and who you are as a person, you get distracted by having a fantasy in your mind about whom you wish you could be and where you wish you could be and all of that and this comes from the qareen so this is a, a qareen issue a lot of empaths have from childhood where the qareen will distract you from your life purpose by making you obsessively and consistently dream about being someone else okay because you used it as a coping mechanism when you were a child and it worked for you okay it worked so when you are an empathic child with an imaginary friend, you can pretend to have a different family, right? You can pretend to be a happy child. You can pretend to not be bullied at school and you're loved by everybody. You live in your own head and this can be good and it can be bad. So parents really have to take note of this and observe if their children are doing this and you need to allow your children to um, be present in their in their life and to have this imaginary friend as something they go to every now and again, not something they depend on to be happy and to get through life, okay? So it's all about communication. If you see your child has an imaginary friend, don't just leave them to it. You know, engage with them and sit with them and ask them about this friend. And this will give you a deeper understanding of their mindset and how they think and how they perceive the world. Okay, so this is important. And when it comes to the children who are not so empathic and who play with the jinn, you also want to understand, you know, what is it that they do, who they play with. Ask them about these, you know, these friends that they have. It will give you a, an amazing understanding of the jinn as well. You will understand so much about the spiritual world by just listening to children. Don't think they're crazy. Don't, like I said, don't go, you know, 
sending them off for psychology assessments and everything. Just listen to them. Listen to them. You'll be fascinated at what comes out of their mouths and what they tell you about the spiritual world that they're involved in. Because a lot of problems can come out of this. As I mentioned before, sometimes the jinns, they make children do things and then it gets the children in trouble. So the children are trying to explain to you, it wasn't me, it was my imaginary friend, George. And, you know, you as the parent, you don't believe them. You have no idea what they're talking about. You think they're just trying to escape accountability and you punish them. And then when you punish them because you don't believe them, you think you're, you know, you think they're making it up. You can cause problems between you and them and this turns into a childhood trauma for them okay and then they won't trust you and then they will never tell you anything again then when something really serious comes up you're not going to be the first to know about it so listen to them okay don't punish them for things that they do when they're blaming it on the imaginary friend this imaginary friend could be a jinn okay and these jinns do tell them to do things that are not good it gets them in trouble so instead of just punishing them and disciplining them have a good sit down with them and communicate, find out what's going on and why this jinn is asking them to do these things and why they're listening to this jinn. What happens if they don't listen to the jinn? Okay, get a deeper understanding of it. I get so many parents coming to me and they tell me that their children have imaginary friends and sometimes these imaginary friends are people whom, you know, tell them to do bad things and um, they want me to speak to their children. I'm like, no, you need to speak to your children. You need to find out exactly what's going on in their heads and in their lives, right? It's a completely different life that you can't see. It's a spiritual world you can't see. And eventually children will come out of it. Some people don't, right? Some people up until adulthood, they still see the jinn, right? Even if they don't see them, they can feel them. This can sometimes drag but for the majority of people, they leave the spiritual world just before they hit puberty. So they won't have any of these imaginary friends or anything anymore because خلاص, they've reached a level of consciousness where them being involved in the spiritual world could be very dangerous for them as people who are aware. Okay, when you're aware, you can start using this to your advantage in a negative way. And if you become friends with the jinn, as you know, it could get you into a lot of trouble. You do things for them, they do things for you, and it gets you into shirk and all sorts of things. So it's important for you to address this problem with them early on and have good communication if they're telling you or if you're seeing that they have imaginary friends. Now, some people have asked me, if children are drawn to good people, to empaths who have great energy, then why is it that my child absolutely adores their narc father or their narc mother or their narc grandparents and they're horrible people? Why is it that, you know, they become very attached to them? And the answer is bribery, okay? So you can bribe a child, even if you are a bad person, you can bribe a child with what they desire, Okay, so children always desire things. They like toys, they like sweets, they like chocolate and cake and, you know, fun fairs and candy floss. They love all these things. Video games, PlayStation. If someone who is narcissistic bribes a child with these things, with fun and treats, then more likely than not, you're going to attract that child towards you. And I used to see it so much, you know, when I used to go to Eid gatherings, for example, and you always get that one narc uncle and children don't like him, right? Because he's tough and he's mean. And if he brings out the money, the Eid money, and he says to them, come, you know, come and give your uncle a hug and a kiss and I'll give you your Eid money. You see them reluctant. They've got one foot in and one foot out. Like, you know, they're hiding behind their mum sometimes. Do I go? Do I not go? I want the money, but I don't like the uncle. I want the money, but his energy is bad. You know, they know something's really off with the uncle. But if the uncle insists and maybe he adds a bit more money, you know, maybe he adds some sweets to the, you know, to the mix, the child eventually will come to him and give that uncle what he wants. He'll get the hug and he'll get the kiss in return for the money and the sweets 
kids can't help it, right? Even if they're pure hearted and everything, they can't help but be drawn to narcissistic people when there's a bribe involved. So if you tell a child, you know, if you come here and give me a hug, I'll take you to the fun fair, more likely than not, you're going to get the child coming to you because they want to go to the fun fair. So when this happens on a regular basis, you'll find that the child becomes accustomed to doing what the narc wants in return for all this fun and all of these treats. Now with an empath, it's different. So an empath doesn't have to bribe a child to come to them. Children are drawn to them naturally because they have emotional nurturing that the narcissist can't give them. So you'll find that children will run towards empathic people because they want hugs and kisses and you know there's no bribe involved but with narcissists because they can't offer that love and care and nurturing and all that affection they have to use the material side of life to get children to come to them so that they are not seen as bad people right so he can he or she can brag and be like oh children love me well yes they love you because you're the one who's buying them all of these gifts and you're the one taking them to the fun fairs and you're the one buying them all these sweets of course the kids are going to come to you it doesn't mean they love you but they'll be drawn to you and this is why there is a danger of predators when it comes to children so predators know this very well they've mastered this art so pedophiles and you know, just people who kidnap children and people who groom children, when they go to parks, they know exactly how to, you know, it's like they're like the Pied Piper. They know how to get children into their trap. And they do it by offering them sweets and offering them, you know, gifts and toys. So you've got to be careful because that is how children are reeled in by knocks. So you might find that your child is very much attached to the knock parent. It'll be because of that. Right, it'll be because of that. But when it comes to their emotional security, they will always prefer to be with you. And an important note that I'd like to make is that be very observant in regards to who the child is actually scared of. Okay, sometimes a child will be terrified of an adult and it could be an indicator that they're abused by that adult. And it could be various types of abuse. It could be physical it could be verbal, it could be emotional, it could be sexual, okay? So if you find a child is absolutely terrified of an adult and don't want to go near them and they hide from them, this is a huge indicator that they've been abused by this person. Now, moving on to children and animals. I've mentioned it a few times before in my podcast, but The spiritual world of animals is very healing for children because animals also have pure souls. And I'm talking here mainly about animals that do not eat meat, okay? So if you want to get your child a pet, especially if they're very young, so under the age of 10, then I would advise that you do not get them a predatory animal such as a cat, a dog or anything like that. Get them a plant-eating animal. And the reason why I say this is because if the evil jinn decide to possess the body of an animal, they possess the body of predatory animals. So animals that have fangs and canines, okay? So you're not going to find the jinn possessing your pet hamster, (laughs) right? If it gets angry and aggressive, it's because you haven't fed him. It's not because he's possessed. But... It's very important for you to understand this because lots of children will develop spiritual issues from animals that have been possessed as well by the evil jinn. Okay, so it's best to rule it out and only keep animals that eat plants. You know, rabbits, guinea pigs, chickens, gerbils, goats, you know, whatever it is, just make sure that they aren't predatory animals and you will lessen your chances that way of having problems with children and their spirituality and as I mentioned before you're more likely to have more angels around your children at home if you don't have dogs at home for example because you've seen it so many times on Instagram and TikTok videos of people who have had near-death experiences or they've managed to escape a horrible accident by the skin of their teeth and that's because angels were there to protect them Okay, so for example, you see those videos of 
like a child trying to climb up onto a kitchen counter and then pulling a cable and it's the cable to the kettle that's just got freshly boiled water in it and alhamdulillah it misses them right they pull it and the kettle falls on the floor but it misses the child this is the angel protecting them so they don't get burned so like i said take all precautions to you know not repel the angels from your house especially if you have young children and another thing that's fascinating about children is the dreams they have. So they actually dream about Jannah a lot and they dream about the Barzakh a lot because as their souls are taken up, they get to visit all their loved ones who have passed away. And that's why I said earlier that so many people will communicate with these children via dreams and if they're orphans, they will see their parents a lot in these dreams. Okay, again, it's a mercy from Allah for them, where their soul is taken to the barzakh when they sleep, so they can be comforted by their loved ones. And they see Jannah so much. I have spoken to so many children, some of them non-Muslim, and when I ask them about their dreams, they have described Jannah to me. They have told me about rivers of honey, rivers of milk. They've told me about horses that fly. They've told me about um castles of like rubies and pearls and all of these things so i'm 100 percent sure a lot of children if not all of them visit jannah in their dreams and they get to see the good side of the barzakh because remember there are two sides one side is for the good people and the other side is for those who are being punished so out of allah's mercy again he doesn't allow their souls to pass the disturbing side of the barzakh and the reason why is because children are not accountable for their sins, so they don't need to see it, right? They don't need a reminder of it. They don't need to be subjected or exposed to any of the punishments that happen in the barzakh. So they only get to see the beautiful side. They get to see their loved ones, and they get to see Jannah, and they get to see everything that's good. And like I said, the nightmares they have come from their subconscious. So it would be from what they've seen during the day. Now, adults are different. Adults can see the ugly side of the barzakh where people are being tormented and punished and that serves as a reminder for you to fix up. Okay, it's for you to fix up. Sometimes adults wake up in a, a very heavy sweat and, you know, they would have said, oh, I've just had the worst nightmare. I've seen people get tortured. I've seen this. I've seen that. It's a reminder for you. Okay, because as the soul gets taken up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we sleep, it passes the barzakh on its way up. The same way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ascended when he went to the journey of al Isra' wal Ma'raj. Okay, he when he went up, he passed the good side of the barzakh and the bad side. So a lot of people will visit the good side of the barzakh and they'll see the bad side of the barzakh too. And that's why you dream of your loved ones who have passed away in certain situations, either happy or or very unhappy, especially if these dreams are before Fajr. And sometimes you'll get messages from people in the barzakh. Someone might ask you to do sadaqah on their behalf. Someone might ask you to pay a debt. You know, if you want to learn more about this, there's a book called al Ruh, The Soul, by Ibn al-Qayyim al, al It's one of my favorite books, and it explains how people can communicate with those in the barzakh via dreams. So sometimes, you know, someone is being tormented, and they need sadaqah, right? They need someone here in the dunya to do sadaqah on their behalf, to lessen their punishment or to make dua for them or, you know, or whatever. And then there are people on the good side of the barzakh who want you to know that they're in a good place. So perhaps you might be depressed over losing them or, you know, you're still crying over it and they want you to know and be comforted by the fact that they're okay. So the barzakh is a fascinating subject and it's a place children know about from their dreams and I've noticed as well sometimes when I've asked children to you know write me stories or to draw pictures they draw pictures of Jannah they draw pictures of what they've seen in the barzakh from their dreams they've you know they draw a picture of like their grandma who passed away and she's very happy and she's got lots of flowers and gardens and everything in the picture because that's where they saw her in the dream they saw their nan in a good place that's got beautiful things around her, trees and fruit and, you know. So pay attention to what children draw. I pay attention to what children tell you about their dreams. 
it might seem boring to you to hear their stories about their dreams and sometimes it can take them a long time to explain them but listen to them well you'll be fascinated and I truly believe that too many people are not giving their children enough attention I know someone who has a child who dreams about their grandmother quite a lot and um, one day they had a dream where the grandmother came to them and they were upset and they asked the child to tell their mother to not forget the sadaqah. So the child woke up in the morning and he went to try and tell his mom, Mama had a dream about, you know, Nan, and she said this and she said that. She wasn't paying attention, right? She's like, oh, okay, good, good, you know, you saw Nan and dream, okay, great. And then he kept having the same dream again and again and again until the mother actually sat down to listen to what he was saying and she realized that the nan was communicating via him to to remind her about the sadaqah. And she said, subhanallah, that was the one year where I didn't do sadaqah on behalf of my mother because I was so busy and I was traveling and we were moving house. And she said, he reminded me to do the sadaqah on her behalf. So it means that the sadaqah reaches them and it helps them. And if... There are going to be messages coming from the people of the Barzakh. It will be via children. Okay, so listen to your children's dreams. As there might be a message in there for you from someone in the Barzakh. And empath adults are also more likely than others to receive messages from people of the Barzakh. Because the people in the Barzakh know that these people are God-fearing. And that they will actually do something about their request. So it's a fascinating subject. Because children are in their purest form before they start to speak. And the more they speak and the more they become aware, the less they see the spiritual world. And that's out of protection for them. And as we know, the purest of children are those who are under the age of four. And unfortunately, in satanic cults, it is these children under the age of four who are the prime sacrifice for Iblis. And you will notice as well that any animals that are to be sacrificed for Iblis have to be plant eaters. And the reason for that is because Iblis knows that predatory animals can be contaminated by the evil jinn who possess them. So Iblis always requests plant eating animals and the purest of children as a sacrifice. And that's why we have so much child trafficking around the world because they're actually sacrifices for Iblis and this is why it's so important for you to understand why Iblis targets the children to corrupt the parents, to corrupt the family. They will use children to cripple your Iman by making parenting so difficult because you do not understand what it is that children are going through in the spiritual world. And the sacrifice is not just for Iblis, even in Islam, when we sacrifice an animal like in Hajj, it has to be a plant-eating animal because they are the purest. And people who eat meat-eating animals have something seriously wrong with them. That's why it's haram. It's haram for you to eat carnivores for that reason, okay? Because many of them are contaminated, not only with diseases in the blood from everything that they eat, that makes them nudges and dirty, but also from the spiritual contamination of evil jinn that possess them. And so Iblis and his soldiers love to target the purest of creation and contaminate it. Okay, so when children are being subjected to sexual harassment and rape and other physical abuse or verbal abuse, this contaminates the child. Right, this damages the child and it taints the purity of the child because shayateen and ins well jinn have got their claws into them to contaminate them. Okay, so this is why Iblis is so obsessed with the children of Gaza. Okay, the children of Gaza have to go. They are the sacrifice. And because they are the sacrifice, they will stop at nothing. Shayateen and Ins or Shayateen and Jinn, they'll stop at nothing until they murder the maximum number of babies and children under the age of four as possible because this is very pleasing to Iblis. Okay? 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows this to backfire on Iblis. Why? Because Iblis also knows, and this burns him, that all these children are going straight to Jannah. There's no hisab for them. He knows that Jannah is better for them than this dunya. He's jealous of these children. However, the reason why he is allowing this mass murder to happen is because he wants to cripple the iman of many people. And when he cripples the iman of many people who are watching all of these children die and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not willed for anything to happen yet or come to their rescue, what's going to happen? Iblis knows many people will lose their faith. So children are used to cripple people's faith. So it's also a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many people are saying, you know, where is Allah? Where is Allah in this? Why is he not, you know, coming to the rescue of all of these children who are dying? It's a test from him to see your patience and your trust in him and his plan. And it's also a challenge for Iblis to cripple the faith of the people who are watching this genocide. Okay, because Iblis knows that if he targets the children, it will get to the hearts of people more than if they were adults to be killed. So when people see newborn babies that are minutes old, hours old, be killed, there's more of an anger towards the situation of, you know, or the thought of why does Allah not do something? You know, why has Allah not done anything until now? There is a time that Allah has prescribed for his help to come. But in the meantime, none of these children's lives are going to waste. They're all going to Jannah. They are all spared the life and the tests of this world. And their mission in this life is to separate the true believers from those who have very weak iman or those who worship Iblis or those who are hypocrites, right? All of this is now coming to the surface and we are seeing so much good come out of the situation such as many conversions happening around the world and people siding with the Palestinians for the first time. So Allah will always turn Iblis's plans into something for the greater good. But we always have to remember that Iblis will use children to break homes, cause stress, cause problems, cause divorce because people are fighting over the children because the children are not behaving, the children are being difficult and it's because you don't know or understand the spiritual you know, battles and hardships that these children are going through, especially if they are experiencing something negative from the spiritual world, like dealing with evil jinn, children, and so on and so forth, okay, from what I've explained before. Now, children can also be affected by evil eye and black magic. So there will be children who don't have imaginary friends, don't have anything like that, but they have spiritual issues because someone or people have given them very bad ain, okay, very bad evil eye. And this can cause a child to be very naughty, be very sick. They can lose their beauty. They can lose, you know, their joy in life. They don't want to play anymore. They don't want to study anymore at school. They don't want to do anything. And this is often you know, a result of people oversharing pictures and videos of their beautiful children online. Please stop doing this if you are someone who does this. Because when you're out in public, when you're, you know, living normal life and people give you ain, then that's on them. Because you've invited them into your house, you've invited them to a gathering, you've gone to the park and people have given you this evil eye, that now becomes their problem. Now your child may be inflicted with it, but you haven't invited them to come and give your children ain. But you do when you post them online, okay? When you brag about how beautiful your children are, how smart they are, how well behaved they are, you know, how well dressed they are. If you're putting so much of this online, you're inviting the evil eye to come to you. You're forcing people to give it to you. Okay? This is something that's got to stop. Wallahi, you're harming your children. Haram. You're making them go through all sorts of things because you're not protecting them. A part of your duty as a parent is to protect your children. You've got to protect them from evil eye as much as possible. And that means not posting them you don't need to post them people are screenshotting all of these pictures and sharing them with people who don't have good hearts you've got to be careful 
And as for those who do black magic on children, it's usually done as a way of getting revenge on the parent or ruining the life of the parent. So sometimes, unfortunately, the children are the sacrifice when it comes to black magic because they know that if the child is afflicted with black magic, it will cause the parent to go into despair because the child is now very sick or the child may have even died as a result of black magic and sometimes even very strong ain. You know, people have died from ain and black magic. So, you know, sometimes if you find your child acting in a very strange way, again, it's jinn possession because essentially what black magic is, is the sending of an evil jinn into the body of the person who the black magic is being done on. And it causes the person to, you know, it could be anything in accordance to what the intention is behind the magic. If it's to make them sick, it will make them sick. If it's to make them angry all the time, the jinn will cause that. If it's to make them cry all the time or not want to leave the house or become very fearful, that's exactly what the jinn will do. So the jinn that is assigned to the black magic will do exactly what the magician has asked them to do. And it can be very difficult to get rid of. It could be really difficult to get rid of. And that's why I say to you, if you have any suspicion, any suspicion that there are people around you who do this kind of stuff, stay away from them. And you can't always protect yourself from these people, right? They could be the sneakiest person in your family whom you'd never think could ever do things like that. So this is why the adhkar are very important. I repeat again, read your adhkar. And read them on your children. Read Ayat al-Kursi on your child. Put Surat al-Baqarah on at home if you think your child has a spiritual problem or jinn possession. You've got to do it. And especially before they sleep. So if you want to ensure that they don't have horrible nightmares, make sure you read the adhkar on them before they go to sleep. So if you're going to read them a story, make sure the adhkar comes after the story. It has to be the last thing they hear before they go to sleep. So just make it a daily habit of reading Ayat al-Kursi. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Surah Al-Ikhlas And this dua أَعُوذُ بِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ التَّامَّاتِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقِ Okay, I seek refuge in Allah from all the evil that has been created and is present in this dunya. So that will encompass everything. That could be dangerous plants, dangerous animals, dangerous people and jinn and so on, okay? That will literally include everything. So get into the habit of saying this every day, inshallah, and you'll be protected. And like I said, do things that encourage the angels to be in your home. Get rid of the things that repel the angels from your home. If you have big pictures of people around your home, you might want to take them down because angels don't like them. And some evil jinn actually like to live in pictures, especially paintings. Okay, when you paint a realistic image of a human, they're actually very drawn to that. And that's why when you go to art galleries, especially ones like the Louvre in Paris, you'll find that, you know, the eyes in paintings follow you around everywhere. So wherever you stand, it looks like the painting is looking at you. It's because the jinn like to live in them. I'm not trying to creep anyone out. But I'm trying to give you the explanation as to why the Prophet Muhammad mentioned things in hadith, okay? So when Jibreel السلام, told him that angels don't like pictures, that was the reason why. Because the jinn like to live in them. And back in those times, people used to paint portraits of each other and they used to create statues and mujassamat, which are like, you know, clay models of heads and animal heads, those are even worse than pictures. So if you have statues of humans or animals, they definitely attract the jinn. I walked past a London hotel um, a few weeks back and outside the hotel they've got gargoyle statues so they look like beasts and I got goosebumps just walking past them. There's something really disturbing about statues and it's definitely forbidden. Okay, so if you've got statues in your home or statues in your garden, you want to get rid of them because the jinn, the evil ones, will definitely be in there. 
And the same goes for China dolls as well. There's something very creepy about China dolls and that's not from horror movies. I don't watch horror movies. But just looking at China dolls, the porcelain dolls, the lifelike dolls, even the baby dolls, just, yeah, I just find them really creepy. And it's best not to have them in children's rooms, okay? Because again, the jinn like to occupy anything that looks realistic. So if your children must play with them and they can't be without them, then put them in a trunk, okay? Lock them away in their room or lock them away somewhere else where they're not on display during the night. Okay, put them away. So at least, you know, the energy will get better in the room. And only take them out when the child wants to play with them and then put them straight back afterwards. And I want you to think about something. Where do you think the idea of Toy Story came from? You know, all the toys that come to life during the night. These are all possessed toys. They're all possessed toys. And they've taken the idea from this and created a children's movie out of it. So it's just something to think about, okay? Everything that's been mentioned in Islam has been mentioned with a purpose. And it's movies like this that, subhanAllah, just give that evidence as to why there are things that, you know, when we're told not to do them, there's a benefit in there for us. So I hope you've enjoyed the podcast, inshallah. I'll end it here. I hope I've given you an interesting insight into the life of children from a spiritual perspective and that, inshallah, it helps you to be better parents And if you're not parents yet, then inshallah, it will encourage you to take the extra step of making sure that you marry someone empathic and someone who is capable of raising children in a happy, caring and loving home. Okay, because you want to avoid all of these problems with children when you get married. It's just an extra hardship. It's an extra burden you're going to give yourself if you choose the wrong person to marry. So thank you for listening until now if you're still with me. If you've got any questions or comments, do drop them below. And if you need one-to-one counselling and coaching, just drop me an email to the address below in the description box and I'll get back to you, inshallah. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Please do like the podcast if you found it beneficial and share it with those whom you feel could really benefit from this. And if you haven't read my book yet, please do grab a copy. It's called The Muslim Narcissist. And it has so much information in there about personality disorders and you'll learn so much about yourself as well. So do grab a copy. It will help you heal from your traumas, inshallah. So the next podcast, inshallah, will be about raising teenagers and how to navigate their new relationship with their qareen. Okay, so until then, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.